On behalf of Chancellor Gilliam and Provost Dunn, um, I wanted to welcome you today. Um, I, I know that you're as excited as I am about this agenda and um, the opportunity to really dig deep about um, uh, how we support uh, the communication around our scholarly work. Um, as uh, the chief research officer, if we're not uh, interested in how we support that work, but how we disseminate it, then why are we doing it? And so um, in terms of digital scholarship, really get having the opportunity to talk to experts, to listen to each other about what is needed to really support the um, uh, lifting up of that scholarship, the infrastructure that needs to be behind that, uh, thoughtful ways in which we increase accessibility, and then also how we sustain those efforts over time. And so um, I really want to um, thank uh, Dean Halbert for bringing this together, also a scholarly communications committee of which I'm a part, and the chairs back there at the, at the table, Beth Bernhardt, um, for all the work that we've been doing thinking about these issues on our campus and how we can move that forward. I'm very appreciated, appreciative of um, the panel and all the speakers today that I know are really gonna help us deepen our understanding, get us excited about next steps, and I hope we'll build some new collaborations as we're going forward. So thank you for being here. Martin, thank you so much for your leadership on this issue, and uh, have a wonderful day. I'm Martin Albert. I'm the Dean of Libraries here at UNC Greensboro, and I would also like to welcome you to this event. Um, this Scholarly Communication Symposium is now an annual event that we do to explore and delve into some uh, targeted aspect of the evolving scholarly communication landscape. This year's program is looking at the intersection of scholarly communication and uh, infrastructure, and how the infrastructure that we develop to advance new forms of scholarly communication these days in the, uh, coming to the end of the second decade of the 21st century, uh, you know, are enabling new forms of scholarship, and uh, fundamentally important in the, the whole cycle of scholarly communication, you know, as we think about not only the creation of the, doing the research, uh, presenting and disseminating the research, but also the long-term preservation and sustainability of those uh, apparatus uh, systems that enable this, these new forms of scholarship. Um, we're delighted to see all of you here um, to you know, participate in this event today. I know some people have come from around the country as far away as uh, Texas and Washington, D.C., I heard this morning, um, and probably elsewhere. Uh, our presenters are from as far away as Canada. Um, I will introduce our keynote in just one moment. Uh, but we're very delighted that you can make it here to Greensboro to share this uh, event with us. Um, let me transition. Oh, and one other thing, the, um, well, just logistics. There, there are bathrooms right outside the door out there. Um, if you need, if you parked, uh, if you drove in from somewhere and you need a parking pass, we've got them up at the registration table. Uh, see one of our, our people during one of the breaks. And um, also, we did have one of our presenters that's on the uh, schedule on the web was not able to make it here today. She got stuck in Chicago, Valerie Horton, unfortunately, because of the unfortunate weather. Um, we adjusted the schedule so it won't match what you saw on the website. So just a little bit of a, a change at the last minute. Um, so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Eltis, the emeritus uh, Robert W. Woodruff Professor of Emory University, uh, a longtime colleague and a good friend um, that I, I worked with for a number of years at Emory University. David is, uh, I can say, the world expert on the history of the transatlantic slave trade. Not only did David uh, make quite a name for himself in, the, in his original research, traditional research into the history of the slave trade, but he had a vision for how you could completely transform 
the traditional way that the history of the transatlantic slave trade was investigated, uh, which was, uh, uh, in the old days, a very traditional process. Scholars would look at the records, the archival records of uh, voyages of uh, the slave trade, both of embarkation of captives uh, from Africa and disembarkation here in the New World. Uh, and they would know everything about one individual port and almost nothing about the entirety of the slave trade. Uh, there was a great tradition of sort of hoarding one's records uh, and not really sharing them. And what, of course, that meant was there was very little understanding of the overall phenomenon of the slave trade. Uh, David's great insight and even more astonishing, his ability to convince traditional scholars to share their information in the interests of the larger, uh, the benefit of the larger scholarly community enabled the creation of this remarkable uh, database that for the first time shone a light on the captivity of millions of individuals in the history of the slave trade. Uh, it was my great privilege to work with David for a number of years on this project and uh, I, I could not be more delighted to have David as our keynote today. He knows, uh, I would say, more than almost anybody else about how technology can revolutionize scholarship and make new kinds of uh, scholarly endeavors possible. So let me turn it over to David Eltis. Uh, this reminds me actually of uh, Martin's first invitation to me to attend, uh, I'm not sure if it was the first scholarly symposium, maybe the second or third, S certainly uh, quite a few years ago when I first arrived at Emory. And at the end of the keynote, uh, one of the first questions was, what are we going to do with all those older professors who are particularly accessing the web? And there was a pause. <coughs> Well, replied the speaker, it's just one funeral after another. <laughs> and I looked around the room, saw the nodding heads. I realized that even at that stage, I was the oldest person there by a country mile. <laughs> I don't think the situation's improved since. <laughs> so what do I know? <laughs> well, I have a, a sort of successful project to talk about. Um, I have a tale of woe uh, and a glimmer of two of hope, uh, but overall, um, the next little while, I don't think it's going to be ter terrifically upbeat. The fact is that we've, we're closing in now on 30 years since Tim Berners Lee brought up the World Wide Web. And it remains the case that a scholar who wishes to make research findings permanent, permanently available, sh should really find a publisher, traditional publisher, <laughs> and preferably one with a hard copy portfolio. Uh, Microsoft's ebook store is closing, so I know. And with this, any books bought through the service will no longer be readable. Uh, e-book stores from Amazon, Apple, Google, Kobo, Barnes & Nobles, they all follow the same rules. You may not like this, uh, but what we've been doing all the time is buying licenses to read, not licenses to own. So we're putting canyons of books into storage, proliferating online-only outlets for research. But the sad truth is, that we have yet to come up with anything digital that matches the printed page for survival. So while the costs of putting up a project on the web are modest, maintaining it there is simply way beyond the capacity of the individual scholar. And in practical terms, given personnel and priority changes within institutions, it's even beyond the capacity of an institution it's hardly surprising, I think, that global growth of hard copy books continues to expand, while e-book sales have 
plateaued somewhat since 2014. And perhaps this is the main reason for the impressive persis persistence of the traditional publishing model, certainly in academia. Major publishing companies basically offer the nearest thing to permanence. After 20 years in the game, I know there's no such animal as a successful digital humanities project. Uh, if by successful, we mean likely to have a lifespan equivalent to that of a print book. Uh, those that come closest are typically in fields that command strong interest from non-academics. Topics such as the Civil War, the Holocaust, and in the last two decades, um, given race relations in the US, maybe the, maybe the slave trade. So I'm going to illustrate this theme with my own experience of attempting to create a permanent digital humanities site. Uh, and as you can see, I have the advantage of specializing in a field, uh, planting slavery and the slave trade, which in the course of my long career, I think has moved to center stage of scholarly interest. The field's major journal, uh, called Slavery and Abolition, publishes an annual bibliography that actually shows a 200-fold increase in published scholarship between the 1950s and today. And then, on the public interest side, especially genealogy, we have probably an even faster expansion. If ever an academic website was going to become a permanent fixture on the web, one would have anticipated that a site like this, pulling together information on three and a half centuries of slave trading in the Atlantic world, would be it. Yet, despite two decades of effort, actually five if we include the pre-web era, millions of dollars of support, and on a cumulative basis, millions of users, we have still not come close to the goal of self-sustaining permanent status. My perhaps somewhat jaundiced view of prospects uh, for new DH projects is that the outlook is as bleak now as it has ever been. I told you it was going to be that bleak. <laughs> But first, uh, a quick review of this particular project. Uh, beginning with uh, IBM punch cards in 1970, uh, Slave Voyages has faithfully reflected the changes in platforms, coding languages, operating systems that have risen, shone briefly, and then disappeared without trace uh, in the last half century. Uh, and yet, the, the project that started with punch cards is moving on to give use the control of a camera to explore a 3D model of a slave ship reconstructed from historical data. And not too far down the road, there'll be experimentation with VR headsets. Uh, the starting point, at least electronically, is what you can see on the screen. It's a CD-ROM iteration of the set, published by Cambridge University Press in 1999. It featured details of 27,000 transatlantic slave voyages. It initially cost $235, and it sold 1,000 copies. Um, of course, in its aftermath, as the web expanded, we realized that this insufficient, and by 2008, a greatly expanded uh, version of the site, which is not what you're seeing now, this is the very latest one, but by 2008 we had a version of the site up on the web, uh, written on 
unfortunately, in a language that did not become popular, uh, a version of Java server pages technology. And by 2015, it was clear that advances in server operating systems were forcing us into the horrors of a major recode. And last month, we launched this completely new version, uh, written in Python in a Django framework. However, the fact that the language was named after a British comedy group uh, <laughs> uh, formed in 1969 <laughs> tells you how old it is. And that uh, since we started the week code three years ago, uh, this language too is on the way to obsolescence. Um, I'll return to the question of sustainability in a few minutes, but you get the drift. So the new site offers four large data bases uh, for analysis. Uh, the, core, the core database is this transatlantic set, which has uh, 36,000 details of 36,000 voyages, 258 variables. Um, second, completely a new database in the form of voyages that did not move across the Atlantic, but rather from one port of the Americas to another. And we refer to this as the Inter-American Slave Trade Database. And this offers similar amounts of detail uh, so far for 11,400. Um, one chunk that's missing, but which we're going to absorb was the huge traffic from uh, the upper south to the lower south. And also it's equivalent, most people don't realize, but there was an equivalent going on in Brazil at the same time, from the northeast to the southeast. Uh, a third database is the personal details of 91,000 enslaved Africans. Uh, found on board slave ships. Complete, uh, and this makes it really original, uh, with the African names taken down during the post-1807 era when major powers led by the British were attempting to suppress the slave trade. Finally, uh, the fourth one, we can't claim to have a record of every single voyage that set out from Africa. Uh, so what we did was construct a um, separate database of estimates with its own user interface and uh, an explanation of how we derived these. The interest, I guess I should mention one interesting feature of the database, of the database set, is that three of them, the first three that I mentioned, are actually subject to more or less continuous review. Um, in a sense, these are truly organic because they're subject to corrections and renewal, um, both by users and by editors. And we have an editorial platform built into the site, and of course an editorial board, and this functions something like um, a scholarly journal. And of course what it does is raise the question of version control, which we've handled by uh, offering a download site from which users can retrieve earlier versions of the database. So, um, just a word or two more about this site. It's the typical digital humanities website, I think, sees its role as giving users access to primary uh, sources and, of course, providing tools to draw on them. Uh, I think the basic model was established at the beginning of the internet era by Ed Ayers, uh, the Valley of the Shadow site, which um, followed the effects of the Civil War on people living in two counties, uh, one in Pennsylvania and one in Virginia. Uh, and the site 
basically provided timelines, summaries of major events. It gave, above all, users access to thousands of original documents created by ordinary men and women whose lives were impacted. And until recently, I think digital humanities basically followed this model. Uh, it meant more digitized documents with increasingly uh, GIS and 3D enhancements, but which, in essence, meant combining a wealth of new sources via digitization with existing scholarship, um, then to create new scholarships. Scholarship. Slave Voyages, I think, is always taking a different tack. It's partly in a deliberate attempt to increase our potential audience. Slave Voyages contains few documents and very little interpretation. From the outset, the uh, basic record comprised not a document, but a voyage. And the ambitious and, some might say, hubristic aim of the site was to assemble and reference all surviving information about every slave voyage, whether that came from a document or a secondary source. If anyone in the academy, or, or not, needed to know about any voyage in 350 years of slave trading, then our intention has always been that they would be able to find it in our databases. If they can't find it, we undertake after appropriate vetting to add it. I mean, our claim to completeness may sound outrageous, uh, but it does stem from the fact that for 30 years before the 1999 CD-ROM appeared, scholars have already assembled massive amounts of primary materials from archives ranging from Denmark to Argentina, and have published hard copy catalogues of voyages comprising thousands of voyages. Mm -hmm. All of these we incorporated into the CD-ROM. And because every voyage has its own set of references, our combined overall bibliography now is in excess of a thousand items. Slave Voyages is thus really a secondary source, and I don't really know of any other academic research site that uses this model. Some of you, some of you may, um, in which case I'm certainly like to hear about. Of course, our primary goal, well, this basically is a, a model of the typical DH site. And uh, this, is, this essentially is, is, is our, the model that we follow. Basically, we put slave voyages between the sources and the user. Um, and in effect, do a lot of the hard grunt work uh, so that the user takes off from a different level, a, a different knowledge base than happens with the typical DH site. Now, our primary goal, of course, is uh, to get how users recognize the academic integrity of what we offer. Uh, some users will simply wish to download our databases um, into their preferred programs. But you know, this accounts for less than 1% of total usage. And the central problem of an academic website in a specialized field is that the traffic generated by such usage rarely justifies a grant application. Survival is predicated on a balancing act that keeps the scholar engaged, but at the same time attracts a sufficiently large non-scholarly uh, traffic, basically to sustain funding. So we've had to devote considerable resources and time to developing workspaces and tools for users to figure out their own questions and answers. Uh, in effect, what we've ended up doing is building much of the site with classrooms and non-academic users in mind. Uh, we provide ways for users to present 
present their selection data that go beyond tables and graphs, and thus we've got things like timelines, time lapses, mapping complete with past graphics, and uh, video features, which I'll show you in a minute. So, what we've done uh, is try to widen our pool of potential users. And one important feature of that is recognizing that our unilingual anglophone site was completely out of step with the reality of slave trading patterns in the American world. Two thirds of the slave traders and the slave trading nations had mother tongues other than English. Uh, 
what follows from that, I think, is that the language initiatives that we've taken have not been as successful as we would have liked, because the academic year, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere and Brazil, which is a far better aiming for, uh, should be and should offset much of this pattern. But it's still early days. So that's another way of saying the potential for growth still seems dramatic. Uh, given the point I just mentioned about 4% of all Africans crossing the Atlantic going to the US, but 78% of users accessing the site from the US. However, uh, we're trying to evaluate the site here. Evaluation cannot be done without some reference to costs. Uh, DH projects are rarely assessed from a cost-benefit perspective, in my experience. Uh, but let, you, let me show you my attempt to do it for this. The project has received just over $1.2 million in soft money, mostly from the NEH and Emory, with smaller amounts from the Hutchinson Institute at Harvard and the University of California uh, Humanities Research Institute. If we include funding the archival research that preceded the move to the web platform, which came actually mainly from the UK, then total costs would double. They would amount to, say, $2.2 million. This does not include our share of the salaries of the permanent employees of the Emory Center for the Law Digital Scholarship uh, that have kept the site running for a decade. We should probably add 10,000 a year money costs for that, just to keep the site live. Dividing these costs by the number of users, which seems a logical next step, that comes out to maybe a dollar per user uh, since the site went live. And if we include the research, maybe two dollars a user. Uh, because we are not measuring unique users with Google Analytics, uh, this strikes me as actually quite high, quite expensive, and I often wonder if funding agencies actually did this kind of analysis, whether they would end up advancing quite as much money as they do. Of course, one never knows with the DH site what on earth is going to happen. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit like entrepreneurship. Um, an alternative evaluation would, could be based on dollars per citation uh, and with a bit more effort, dollars per course outline reference. Um, and we're only now beginning to seek out these data. And I imagine we would do relatively well because the site is used in a lot of courses. But even with this more refined methodology, I think such costs would certainly be non-trivial. So one question to ask is, was the information these users retrieved worth more than one or two dollars for them? If a paywall had been in place, would they have crossed it at these rates? Probably not. <laughs> um, but the central point of what I have to say today is that these costs are not likely to decrease in the future. Uh, you might think, well, the startup costs are going to obviously affect the first 10 years, but after that, it's surely going to be less. That's just not true. Um, in other words, we've not found the holy grail of the digital humanities. The inescapable truth is that it's not possible to walk away from site development. Leaving a site unchanged results in atrophy and accelerating erosion of traffic. You can actually see this, I think, beginning to take effect in that uh, table I showed you uh, a couple back, the table on usage. Um, 
so that even though a lot was happening on the back end during those years, the front end remained the same. And I think uh, it was one of the major reasons why traffic stabilized. So, the look and the feel of the site, I think, is critically important and has to be kept up to date. So, our team uh, at Emory, actually it's wrong to say at Emory because they're scattered all over the Atlantic world, uh, I think our team has this sort of mantra which says a laurel rested on is a laurel withered. And I think there are three factors that guarantee the validity of that statement. Um, one, of course, is the continual aging process for the coding language, which we've had to wrestle with in the last 10 years. The second is obviously the continual advances in web design and the expectations of the user that any DH site will reflect these advances. Uh, and the third is the evolution of the content of the specialized field itself, and that indeed the site is intended to reflect. Plus, of course, users always expect the latest technology. I think uh, most projects in the digital humanities would see these three factors as suddenly to be covered with soft money raised by grant applications. In other words, they would be viewed as development costs. If we accept this categorization, then our experience, um, I show you. Here's a summary of, of, of the costs of the project over the last few years. Uh, so our experience that is that over time, the ratio of development costs to maintenance costs, by which we mean keeping the site alive, is something in the order of nine to one thousand a year to keep the site from going dark, and ninety thousand a year to stem the loss of users triggered by an aging site that increasingly no longer meets the expectation of worldwide clients. Uh, that's a pretty frightening ratio. Uh, I think, given user expectations, all three of these strictly belong to maintenance category, uh, to the maintenance category. My experience is that uh, if there is no development, then the site is not being maintained properly. If you're not implementing improvements, then you're not keeping up. If we define running costs correctly, then the inevitable conclusion is that 90% of the running costs currently are being financed by soft money from branding agencies. Whatever success Slave Voyages has had, and we've obviously generated a pool of users, we have not even come close to solving the development maintenance dilemma, which is what lies behind the sustainability issue. So you'll not be surprised to hear that we last year jumped back onto the soft money treadmill uh, and by negotiating an award from Mellon. Uh, this one actually intended to support a radical change of direction in state voyages, probably the most radical since the of the web. Uh, in brief, scholarship on slavery and slave trade has moved strongly towards the experience of the individual enslaved person. Uh, to keep in step, we've undertaken to uh, switch the site's focus from, in the long run, from voyages to people, people associated with those voyages. But my question is, as I'm sure you realize, how long can this model that I described be sustained by a single institution? or a single scholar. I mean, is it reasonable that either could generate $100,000 a year, year in, year out, to sustain a single project, regardless of the traffic it generated? Personnel changes in both that men and faculty alone would suggest the total implausibility of such stability. So, is there no hope? 
Um, I think there's a glimmer. Uh, what we're, we're trying something slightly different. We're attempting to move to a different option based on an idea that Catherine Skinner came up with several years ago, um, and one that at root is multi-institutional. Um, for each individual institution, it's also time-based. Currently, uh, we have an executive committee comprising nine scholars located all over the place, um, all of whom have made major contributions to the site and published on the basis of it. And it meets every week and makes all the decisions on the project. Our, our plan is to formalize this arrangement into a consortium with rotating institutional membership that would run the site um, cooperatively. The legal framework here is um, it's not a corporation, we're not planning a separate entity, it's rather a partnership. Uh, and I'll just run through quickly the basics of that consortium idea. Um, first, we move the cloud, we move the project to the cloud, uh, which of course assumes responsibility for the day-to-day -day performance. We're going to have an estimate on that. I suspect it will be less than ten thousand, substantially less than ten thousand. But there is always some costs for the anchor institution beyond what uh, the cloud was going to cost. Um, secondly, we're going to recruit five institutional members, one of whom would assume the role of anchor institution. The designated anchor institution will have the operational responsibility uh, for managing the assets, subject to the direction of the steering committee, and of course the cloud-based service requirements. Thirdly, uh, institutional members would sign up for a five-year term, renewable, pay an annual fee somewhere between five and ten thousand per annum to the anchor institution to cover the cloud and other maintenance costs, narrowly defined. Fourth, uh, of course, members, member institutions will have their names and logos prominently displayed. Um, and will be obviously authorized to identify themselves as members. And five, uh, each member will get to appoint a, uh, an individual to the steering committee that makes the decisions. Uh, this structure does not solve the sustainability issue per se. Even if we had fees of 10,000 a year, which I don't think we would, and say five members, that would still leave a shortfall of 50,000 a year, given that our experience suggests we need 100,000 a year just to keep this thing running. But I think the great value of multi institutional membership is that it widens the base for launching soft money. Uh, funding applications. Um, and I think we've already moved towards this model even before the consortium was set up, because this new version of, say, Voyagers is actually underpinned by successful applications to the NEH from three separate universities Emory, UC Irvine, and UC, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, as you can see from this um, summary of cost sheets, uh, summary cost sheet. So uh, I think actually I'm pretty sure I could go to four institutions right now and, and get a five-year commitment uh, to do this. We're not we're not quite in the position of um, doing it yet because we just launched this and we had to get onto the, um, uh, we have to get into Amazon Cloud Services, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm fairly sure we can get, we can 
get it, some interest and commitment from at least um, four institutions, and I think we need a minimum of five or six. So, what are the prospects? I think there are some prospects. The site is sufficiently well known um, and already has participants from so many non-Emory institutions uh, that I think it's possible. That, nevertheless, uh, even if it works, we will still have fallen short because I'm just thinking in 2010, I co-published a course of something called the Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade with 180 colored plates, 306 pages. I'm pretty sure in 50 years, I know that if anyone wants to consult that book, uh, they're much more likely to be able to do so than access slavevoyages.org. I'd be very surprised if between now and 50 years down the road, slave voyages had been able to raise $90,000 a year adjusted for inflation uh, year in, year out. It, looking back over the last 10 years and the struggles we've had, uh, I just don't think it's feasible. And maybe the person or persons that replace me will have a different idea, or maybe they become as sour as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sustainability obviously, as everybody in the room knows, is the key issue. What really I've tried to do is give you some insight into the tale of the world that I've had over the last uh, decade um, and try to be as realistic as possible. Uh, I just, as I spin through the web and look at the different DH projects, I often think, how many of these are going to be around in half a century? And uh, I think we all know the answer. It's, it's not going to be very many. So uh, I thought I'd finish by uh, mentioning sustainability isn't everything. Um, <laughs> actually, it is. <laughs> uh, what other problems have we faced? Uh, I think there's a certain anti quantitative bias um, that is becoming widespread in the humanities. I don't think it's particularly affected our site, but I didn't notice it. Um, and that, I think, I find worrisome. Um, a, a second issue, which uh, I didn't really expect to find, was something that happened when we turned to creating video. The aura was a typical 18th century slave ship. The main deck shows two key features designed to control the male slaves. First, the barricado, a nine foot high wooden wall that divided the ship in two. This was topped with spikes and swivel guns. Second, two iron chains can be seen running along the upper deck. Every morning, the crew brought the shackled male captives up onto the deck from the spaces they had slept in overnight. The crew locked the men's shackles into the chain to restrict movement. African men were not only chained in place, but continually within the firing line of the swivel guns. African women and children were imprisoned behind the barricade, normally unshackled, where they could neither see the men nor speak to them. Fearful that the male captives might escape their chains and try to capture the ship, the majority of the crew also remained behind the barricade. We descend from the quarter deck to the officers' quarters and galley. A cook prepared the slaves' food in this boiler. The captives' diet consisted mainly of starch, such as rice, beans, or flour. 
Enslaved people were forced to eat this monotonous diet twice a day. They drank just two pints of water daily, leading to constant and often deadly dehydration. As the sun began to set, the crew, armed with whips and guns, forced the slaves below deck. The space below was divided by wooden walls to keep the men and women separated. The men were released from the deck chains and forced below, still shackled in pairs. Once below deck, crewmen packed the enslaved men together. Some were forced to lie on top of the platforms around the side of the room. Others lay under the platforms. Each captive on or under a platform slept in a space just 14 to 18 inches wide and 30 inches high. Most were forced onto their sides and pressed against their neighbors. Others sat in their meager intervening spaces. The Aurora's prisoners spent at least 14 hours in such cramped, dirty, and stifling conditions which they endured daily for two or three months before reaching the Caribbean. We have no contemporary depictions of the Aurora's 600 captives as the vessel left Malimba to cross the Atlantic Ocean. We do, however, have an image of a crowned lower slave deck painted on the voyage of a small slaver, the Marie Seraphique, from just a few years earlier. This comes into view in an overlay as the camera zooms out. The overlay shows only 340 captives, while the Aurore carried almost twice this number. I preface this with a comment that there was a problem in the digital humanities, and maybe you can see what it is from the video. Um, what is it lacking? Sorry? Um, that's true. Okay, two things it's lacking. <laughs> Sorry? Exactly. Um, and some of the most uh, spectacular DH projects have dealt with uh, horrific events in human history, um, like the US Civil War, like the Holocaust, um, and slave trade certainly belongs in this group. And uh, this video. It uh, took, took well over a year to build from scratch, and one of the issues was exactly how to represent people. And we solved the issue in the end by not representing people. We established the ship as visiting, approaching Africa, as the commentary suggests. And um, if you look at the various Holocaust sites, uh, you'll find the same phenomenon. There are no people. What you get is camp reconstruction. Uh, you can go to some of the sites like Birkenau and actually take your device outside and see exactly what it was like um, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, but none of them show individuals. And uh, unless you're dealing with major figure is well known, it's pretty difficult in the digital humanities to actually represent anyone, especially those under extreme uh, distress and pressure. It would be unthinkable to have a fly through a gas chamber, for example, and it's just as unthinkable to have a fly through of um, a slave deck uh, in the middle of, of the middle passage. Uh, it's not possible in digital humanities to represent this kind of uh, distress. Um, so I'm not sure it, it destroys the reality of the thing. Um, I think in many ways, actually leaving it the imagination um, that it's just as effective. Uh, but I will say that we did not come up with a solution. 
upstream to the Nathan and beyond that. I'd be interested to hear if others have had similar experiences. Well, why don't we uh, thank David?